so last week unfortunately I got really sick so as a result I did not have a video so I apologize for that I tried to do one on Monday for the teen writers club but ultimately I was sick enough that I didn't end up doing an adult writers club one so I apologize for that but here's the one for this week um, please remember that we are going to be having our meeting on the 28th. However, please also remember the fact that if you want to enter our scary story short story contest this year, that is going to be due by October 7th. So that's a Saturday, which means that we don't, um, we don't close at 9 like we normally do. We close at 6 and it might even do be, be due before that. So I would turn it in on October 6th just to be absolutely safe. All right. Figured I should mention that before we get started. All right, today we're gonna to be talking about crafting a truly vicious villain. Now, it's funny because I knew what I did to craft my own villains, and I knew what I did to make my own stories seem truly horrendous with the villains. But ultimately, there are all sorts of ways to do this. And so I did a lot of research into other authors' methods and other authors' thoughts on this, and even um, some psycho psychological studies. These are the things I found were the ultimate best things for crafting a vicious villain. If you disagree, that's okay. If you agree, great. But this is what I found was the best. All right. First thing to talk about is a clear motive. Now, when you're writing a villain, you don't want it to be like, ah, we have no idea why he's being evil. He's just evil. We don't like that as a reader. Most readers want to know why the villain is doing what they're doing. Now that doesn't always mean necessarily it has to be a logical thing. It can be an illogical thing. It can be revenge. It can be for love. It can be because they think that the ultimate solution to the problem is something drastic and crazy, kind of like Thanos from the Avengers. One of his things is the fact that, you know, if we get rid of half the population, it'll fix all the world's problems whoa buddy <laughs> you know that's where you're kind of like oh, problems so it's not that their their motive his motive is incredibly clear however it's about his actions that are weird and make him a villain you can make their motives be good motives ultimately they don't have to be bad motives Sure, bad motives create bad people, but they can have good motives. I know that recently I was um, watching a show, <laughs> The X-Files. I know it's old, but it's well written most of the time. Um, and there was a particular episode, I will try not to spoil it, where the guy had dealt with someone who had depression. And so as a result, he felt that he could... Um, it was his duty, it was his responsibility to try and heal people who had depression. However, instead of like becoming a doctor and like a good person, he took it to a crazy psychotic route and said, hey, what if I just kidnap them and then force them to feel better? And it's like, whoa, buddy, you're nuts. <laughs> and so you can take it from like a good motive and turn it and twist it into something dark and crazy, right? Um, so that being said, just make sure your motive is clear. It can be complex, it can be convoluted, but it's got to be well known. It's got to be well documented. It's got to be well understood. All right, the next thing that I would say is great in crafting a worthy and proper villain is to make sure that they are worthy of the hero and they're willing to grow with the hero. As they become more powerful and more evil, so does the hero. As the hero continues to become more complex and more um, intense and strong, so does the villain. Um, this is important because we don't like our villains to be stagnant. We don't want our villains to be like, oh, I am evil robot. And then the person's just like, I'm not strong enough. Now I'm strong enough, pow. That's more of a thing that you'll want to experience if you're doing a kid's book. If you're doing a kid's book, by all means do that. Where it's like, hey, we want to steal this thing. We're not strong enough. Pow, well, now we're strong enough. That's fine. But if you're doing something that's young adult, young adult or even tween, I would say we um, generally, at that point, they have a complex enough mindset set that it's important to have that willingness to grow with the hero, willingness to become more evil, willingness to take things to their ultimate conclusion, willingness to continue to grow in resources and stamina and power in order to become even more formidable. We like the fact, we as readers like when the hero is growing, but so is the villain. And so it's a, it's a close race. It's not, oh, the villain's gonna win or, oh, the hero's gonna win. We prefer when it's like, Will the hero win? Will the villain win? We don't know. 
that close race makes the tension far more intense, makes the suspense far more intense, makes it so that readers want to truly keep reading. It gives us motivation to keep reading. All right, the next one is, again, this is kind of similar, but not quite the same. You need it to be a whole person, not a cardboard cutout. So they can't just be like evil for the sake of evil. Here's the little asterisk that I'm gonna put on it though. Why is Sauron such a good villain? Because he's not a person, he's an evil entity, right? So the reason Sauron's acceptable is because of the fact that we as people believe in both people, which are complex evil villains, if you know, psychotic serial killer, can be a complex evil villain, for sure, absolutely. But we also believe in things like the greater evil, right? Darkness, a uncontrollable bestial entity out there that's making people do bad things, you know? Kind of the devil, if you will. So why is Sauron acceptable? Sauron is acceptable because of the fact that he represents all evil and corruption. He is whole evil in and of itself. So the reason he is acceptable is because that is a terrifying concept. The idea that you have to fight the ultimate evil, not just an evil person or an evil, um, or an evil secretary, I don't know. <laughs> not, just some, not just someone who is evil, but the ultimate evil evil. Evil in all caps. Evil entity. It's also important to note that most um, villains, even though they are people, don't always have to be people. If you're writing a nonfiction, um, your evil villain, sorry there was a speck on the screen, <laughs> your evil villain could be the fact that there is a huge earthquake that makes it so the whole town has to come together to pull, uh, to pull through and to survive. That's an evil of nature. So again, it's kind of similar to the Sauron thing. It's this ultimate evil that everyone has to work together to overcome. Whereas a person is different. A person is fallible. A person has motives. A person has means. These are all different things that are important to keep in mind. So if you're doing a villain person, you need to make sure that they're a whole person, that they have motives, means, that they have good as well as bad as part of them. You don't want to make them too redeemable, but you also want to make sure that they are a person, that they're human. Um, you also want to make sure that they feel tangible and real, and they aren't just, I am here to be evil. You want to make sure that they have means, opportunity, and motive. Meanwhile, with villains like Sauron or an earthquake, you wanna make sure that with that one you truly show this is unescapable. You can't get rid of this. You can't avoid this. And ultimately that becomes a villain in and of itself. All right, moving on to continuing on more people villains because this is more of a crafting vicious villains people edition because <laughs> I realized I should have clarified that. Um, I would say psychologically study real villains. This was one that I have done personally, but also that several other authors have recommended. Um, if you're doing a serial killer villain, make sure you read up a ton on serial killers. If you're doing um, just a kind of a misunderstood villain that's like trying to um, do something right, but he's doing it for the wrong reasons, make sure you look into psychologically messed up stuff too. Um, if you're doing a villain that's like a thief and he loves to be greedy and loves all his money, look into the psychology of why people get greedy, why people want money, why what make, makes someone want that much money. Um, if they're uh, lusting after power, make sure that you um, look into why is power so addictive? Why do people want more power? Why would someone want power when someone else doesn't want power? For example, I don't want all power. I just don't. But other people do. So what makes me different from that? Well, it's a psychological difference. So it's important to read about and emulate those things in your own villains. All right, the next point is a strong villain introduction. Now, let's all be honest here. Um, we've never seen a villain like just kinda, hi, I'm a villain. No, they don't shyly stand in the corner and just kinda, hi. Generally, it's a strong introduction, right? Um, for example, we Harry Potter. Now this one's actually kind of funny because she kind of did both for the strong introduction. The introduction of Voldemort was very strong because of the fact that the whole idea was like, do not speak his name, he's so vile. That gives us a strong indication of, whoa buddy, 
this is an intense guy. The fact that people are afraid to speak his name because they're so worried about him, like, being out there and listening, even though they're pretty certain he's dead, like, that's, that's scary. That gives us a strong feeling, a strong vibe about this villain, even if they're not physically there. Now, with that, that's what makes it so interesting when Quirrell shows up, all, the ship's everything was weird. And then you're like, why do I feel so weird about this guy? And it's because he's giving off very iffy vibes, and you're feeling pretty iffy about Voldemort, so you're like, why do these two match? But it's okay, because it's also a plot twist, right? People are not supposed to know that. Thank you, which I apologize. I've never read Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> but the point is, you want a strong introduction for your villain, even if you don't introduce them strong. Physically, Voldemort wasn't introduced very strong, right? But he had a presence so strong that people were willing to talk about it in a way that was terrified and terrifying. So you got to make sure those introductions are strong. If you don't feel the strength of the villain when they walk in the room, how are your readers going to feel that same strength? All right. Now, we kind of talked about this earlier, um, but I wanted to readdress, can they not be a villain? Natural disasters are absolutely an acceptable villain. Ultimate evil is an absolutely an acceptable villain. Um, some sort of, like, um, disease that makes people possessed or do crazy things, that's also a good villain. Um, you can have all sorts of things that don't have to be a person. Just make sure that you use similar things. You do a strong introduction, you make sure that they are a whole entity, not necessarily a whole person, but a whole entity. You um, address all points of the conflict, if it's like an earthquake or a disease or things like that. You address how that works, why it doesn't work, rules, world building, you gotta make sure that's all solid. All right, last two things that I'm going to talk about for this lesson today. Um, you gotta make sure that they feel too powerful to lose. You gotta strike true fear into your readers. If they're not afraid of your villain, then why should they feel intensely when the hero gets kidnapped and is put under danger? I don't feel anything if the villain's not truly scary. However, if the villain's truly terrifying, the villain's truly looking me in the eyes and I feel like death is coming, oh boy. <laughs> That's when you're like, I'm scary. Let's, let's run away. You gotta make sure that they feel too powerful to lose. Now you gotta give them flaws. They can't be completely all powerful, but they have to feel too powerful to lose. They have to seem too powerful to lose, even if that's not true at all. Um, that being said, you can also do this with the natural disasters and whatnot. Um, with a disease, it might seem like, well, people are dying too fast, there's no possible way, and if I die before I find this cure, then what am I going to do? Or you also have the earthquake example where it's like, um, if we don't get food in the next few days, we're all going to die. Those kinds of things make it so it feels overwhelmingly too powerful to conquer, and yet you conquer it anyway. That's what makes really great heroes, is you conquer the unconquerable. We always love seeing that, right, as a reader, <laughs> or at least I do. Um, all right, the last thing that I'm going to mention is when the ultimate end comes for the villain, how do you make it truly satisfying? Do you kill the villain? Do you capture the villain? What is going to be most satisfying for your reader? Now, you don't always have to do what's most satisfying for your reader. You also have to do what's true to your hero. So, for example, if your hero is more of an anti-hero type, then his ultimate end is probably absolutely killing the guy. He's like, you're evil? No, I won't let this happen anymore. Whereas if your hero's like Captain America, where it's like, I'm true to being the best version of myself I could possibly be, he's more the type of person who would probably put someone in jail. He would only kill them if it's absolutely necessary and there's no other option. He would prefer to put someone in jail. He would prefer to take the high road, right? And not morally degrade himself to killing a person, even if they're a terrible person, right? It's kind of it's kind of bonkers that logic, that morality. You got to make sure that your hero is true to themselves, and the villain is true to themselves in that final battle. If your hero and your villain are both true to themselves, ultimately that ending will be super satisfying for your reader, and they will feel it, and it will feel right. All right, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any comments, please leave them down below. If you have any questions, please also do that. Um, Please, I know this. Uh, people sometimes hate when I do this or other people do this. Please like and subscribe. I would love to continue seeing more people and more views come to these lessons. Thank you so much. Bye.